Hey there, anime aficionados. This is the true and secret history of shonen action manga. My name is George, and I run The Land of Obscusion, a blog focused around obscure and forgotten anime, manga, video games, and other media. As you can tell with the title image, I'm playing a little joke on Dragon Ball, Fist of the North Star, and JoJo. They will be in this panel, but only at the end. Anyway, if you were to ask someone, where do you think shonen action originates from? Most would understandably answer with one of those three series, if not simply all of them. The fact of the matter, though, is that very little of what they did actually introduced elements of this genre, if you will. Instead, they mainly refined existing elements into how we generally associate and love shonen action manga, which in Japan is called kakdo manga, or fighting manga. All three of those series debuted in the 80s, too, but there's about a good 30 years of history that led up to this. And this panel is to show how things evolved from the early days into what we have now. That being said, though, we will stop sometime in the 80s, because otherwise this thing will become the panel that never ends, as it will go on and on, my friends. So we're just going to start at the beginning and simply get it out of the way with Astro Boy by Osama Tezuka, which ran from 1952 to 1968. Now, of course, there was manga prior to this, but Astro Boy is effectively the first modern example of manga, showing a change from short stories based on iconic novels and other works to longer, recurring series that Japanese people can claim as their own. The basic concept, for those unfamiliar, is that it stars Astro, or Adam in Japan, as the series is known in Japan as Tetsuan Adam, or the Mighty Adam, a robot boy created by Dr. Tenma because he lost his son Tobio in an accident. Obviously, Dr. Tenma isn't thinking straight because of this tragedy, so he decides to create a robot copy of Tobio. But after a few happy years, Tenma realizes that Tobio doesn't age. Apparently, the genius scientist forgot that he created a robot. So Tenma throws Tobio away, who was then rescued by Dr. Ochanomizu, and given the new name of Adam or Astro. And the main concept for the manga is an Astro wanting to become a real boy, in a world where robots are treated like second-class citizens. Tezuka told stories focusing on racism, detailing the social climate of the 50s and 60s, and obviously told grander themes as the manga went on. It also shows early examples of the tropes and traditions we know of, like enemies becoming friends, friends becoming enemies, the power of friendship, etc. But when you read Astro Boy, it doesn't feel like a shonen action series. Still, if I don't include Astro Boy, then I'm sure someone will wonder why it was excluded. By the by, we likely will skip over certain manga that you might be thinking of. This is a big subject, and this panel is meant to just be a general overview, so I didn't forget, but rather can't simply list all of them. So next we have Eight Man by writer Kazumasa Hirai and artist Jiro Kawada, which ran from 1963 to 1968 for only five volumes, but it is an important one. Simply put, Eight Man is Robocop before Robocop, as it's the story of how Detective Hachiro Azuma is gunned down in the line of duty, only to be reborn by Professor Tani as a superpowered android, with the Eight Man name coming from the idea that he represents the unofficial Eighth Precinct. As for his abilities, Eight Man has super speed, super hearing, and can transform from his human Azuma identity into that of Eight Man. Much like how Superman's identity is hidden behind a pair of glasses, Eight Man's is hidden behind a name that literally has eight in it. Go figure. In essence, this is Robocop if he was a literal superhero, and while it's never been confirmed, it is possible that Eight Man was an influence in the creation of Robocop during the 80s, mainly because we did receive the anime adaptation during the 60s. The manga is included here mainly because while Astro Boy was about a robot boy who wanted to be treated as human, Eight Man is a human who's turned into a robot, and the superpowers seen here can be seen as an early indication of humans being capable of superpower feats. Still, Eight Man is more of a direct influence on later henshin or transforming heroes like Kamen Rider and Super Sentai than it is on shonen action manga in general. Up next is Kamuiden by Sampei Shirado. Not to be confused with the sequel manga, Legend of Kamui, which is what most people know the series in general as. But this original manga ran from 1964 to 1971. Unlike what came before, Kamuiden didn't run in a magazine aimed at a shonen audience but rather ran an alt manga magazine, Garo, which Shirado himself helped create, and it was aimed at older audiences and focused more on the Gekiga movement at the time, which itself was started as a way to make manga for adults rather than the children that manga was generally aimed at at the time. 
This series followed the titular Kamui, a ninja who leaves his clan and becomes a wanted man, always on the run from those who want to kill him. The main thing to take from Kamui Den for this panel is that, while the ninjas seen here were still more like how they were in real life, the way they were portrayed by Shirado, especially in how they fought, would influence the way pop culture in Japan, and eventually the world, would generally portray ninja, mainly through means of weapons and special techniques. After all, the ninja we see now are not all that accurate to the actual historical ninja, and it was Kamui Den that started that shift in what ninja were deemed capable of. Also of note, though, is that while the Gekiga movement aimed to make itself distinct from manga, so you could technically call manga aimed at adults Gekiga, it instead would change the way stories in manga would be told in general, especially in regards to things like dramatic storytelling and romanticization. More than likely, kids started getting curious about Gekiga and, you know, wanted to read them, which in turn prompted manga creators to implement Gekiga elements into their own manga, and in the end, Gekiga kind of died out and just became one giant au revoir of manga itself. But now we're going to start focusing more on the direct evolution of shonen action. So here's Star of the Giants by writer Iki Kajiwara and artist Noboru Kawasaki. Yes, this is a baseball manga, but one thing to think about in the history of shonen action is that you cannot escape the sports genre. No joke, sports manga is the direct reason why we have shown in action as we know it today, and this panel will show you why. Anyway, Star of the Giants ran from 1966 to 1971 and follows Huma Hoshi, whose father Itetsu played third base for the Yomiuri Giants during World War II before an injury retired him early on. Since their mother passed away, Itetsu has to raise Huma and his sister alone, becoming a bitter man. As for Huma, the manga is all about his rise from playing baseball in Little League, to high school, to playing for the actual Yumiuri Giants. Literally, he becomes the star of the Giants. Naturally, this results in the manga having to use storytelling concepts like time skips in order to advance through Huma's life, and when it was adapted into a TV series in 1968, it became the first ever sports anime, which itself was influential in how to adapt manga into anime especially in regards to being able to avoid catching up to the manga as it ran by doing things like slowing the pacing down to heightened drama. In fact, there's a story about how an entire episode revolved around a single pitch, but that's a bit of an exaggeration, though said pitch was stretched out for time by focusing on each minutia of it, adding to the tension. But let's return to Itetsu Hoshi for a moment. Becoming a bitter man following his injury, he's infamous for letting out his anger on Huma, by being a dick of a father. Aside from being a prime example of child abuse, though, Itet's penchant for flipping over the family table during his rage would wind up becoming a common trope in and of itself, especially when it comes to comedy. Naturally, Itet's table flips were kept for the anime. That being said, Itet's abusive attitude, both at home and while training his son, were included to help drive Huma to become a better baseball player, because there's no better way to stick it to his abusive father than to not just become a pro baseball player himself, but to be even better. Another iconic part of Star of the Giants, as seen in some of the covers, is the spring suit Huma wears while training, as the tension of the springs forces him to work his muscles just so he can use his arms normally, let alone pitch a ball. Naturally, Itetsu is a terrible father and forced Huma to do this as a kid. And this helped make for some interesting advertising over the decades, amusingly enough. So next we'll quickly go over Dororo by Osamu Tezuka, which ran from 1967 to 1969. This is the story of Hyakimaru, the son of a wannabe vassal during the Sengoku period who makes a deal with 48 demons in order to gain power. In turn, 48 parts of Hyakimaru's body is stolen by the demons upon birth, which results in his father casting him off like Moses to die, only for the baby to be found by Dr. Jukai, who raises Hyakimaru, gives him his name, and gives him prosthetic limbs. Eventually, Yakimaru finds out about the demons and vows to kill each one in order to regain all of his stolen body parts. Amusingly enough, Tezuka did admit to only creating Dororo because of the jealousy he felt towards Shigeru Mizuki, who was seeing giant success with Gegege no Kitaro at the time. Being the competitive type, Tezuka decided to create his own yokai manga, only for it to be cancelled a year later before being given a quick and dirty finish which is what makes all the adaptations, like both anime series in 1969 and 2019, interesting, as they all offer unique alternate endings. As for Shonen Action, Dororo mainly helped introduce yokai and other monsters to the formula, introducing the idea that the supernatural was a potentially viable option. 
let me just say this right away. Without Ashton Ojo, we wouldn't have shown in action as we know it today. Yes, this is a mostly realistic boxing manga, but it's that important for this history. Running from 1968 to 1973, and written by Iki Kajiwara under the alternate pen name Asao Takamori, and drawn by Tetsuya Chiba, this is the story of Joe Yabuki, an orphaned teen living in the slums of Tokyo. In short, Joe starts off as a genuine asshole, conning people out of money, then wasting it on pachinko machines, taking advantage of anyone he can just so he can benefit himself, and beating the ever-living hell out of anyone that gets in his way. It's that scrappy fighting ability, though, that catches the eye of Dampe Tange, a washed-up and alcoholic former boxer who wants to train Joe to be a boxer himself. At first, Joe simply takes advantage of Dampe, but after getting arrested and sent to Juvi, he meets Toru Rikishi, a boxer serving his own time, and it's a decisive loss to Rikishi that inspires Joe to seriously become a boxer. During its run, an entire generation became inspired by Joe's rise, not just up the boxing ladder, but also in becoming someone that others can look up to. Even parents, who initially complained to publisher Kadansha that Joe was teaching kids how to become cynical delinquents, wound up loving the young man. The Japanese populace loved this manga so much that two actual, real-world funerals were held during its run for characters that died, one at the middle and one at the very end. I could say who the funerals were for, but you can probably guess as they are two of the most well-known spoilers in anime and manga history. Needless to say, the manga itself continues to inspire people to this very day. Its iconic final page has been paid homage to so often that you likely know of it by association alone. Gurren Lagann fans especially know of it. If you haven't noticed yet, there's been a stark lack of anything from the most iconic of shonen manga magazines, Shonen Jump. That's because it didn't debut until 1968, but in its first issue, it had a notable precursor to modern shonen action, Otoko Ipiki Gaki Daisho by Hiroshi Motomiya. Translating roughly as the ideal boys gang leader, the manga stars Mankichi Tokawa, the roughest, toughest young man in town who's willing to take on anyone who gets in his way, with an early notable moment being when he fights 108 people all by himself, which in turn makes him the leader of a group of delinquents in his town. Eventually, Motomiya moves things over to Tokyo, where Mankichi starts dealing with societal issues of the time, primarily by beating up those who do the people wrong. While Gaki Daisho itself doesn't feature much new in terms of shonen action, it would wind up becoming a major influence on later manga creators, most notably Masami Kuramada and Tetsuya Ohara, who both made their own homages to Motomiya's debut work. However, one thing Gaki Daisho did do that was worth mentioning is that it found itself a notable female fan base as Motomiya's art style did have a sort of attractiveness that young women found appealing. There's a story of female fans fighting at where Motomiya's studio was at the time, which resulted in them barricading themselves in front of the door, hoping for a chance to get an autograph. Also of note in regards to Gaki Daisho is that it's also a perfect example of how success can be both the greatest thing to happen to a creator, as well as the most stifling. In 1971, after 87 chapters, Monomiya actually wanted to end the series by having Mankichi die heroically in a massive battle at the base of Mount Fuji, having been stabbed by a bamboo spear, the chapter itself making it look like Mankichi had truly died. However, Jump's editor-in-chief Shigeo Nishimura would later admit in his memoirs that he literally used correction fluid to remove the end kanji Motomiya had placed on the final page, as well as removing the sight of the spear actually stabbing Mankichi. While Motomiya didn't plan on continuing the story, Gaki Daisho had become way too popular for it to just end right then and there, not to mention ending it with the beloved main character being killed off suddenly. So Motomiya had to make the next chapter explain how everyone managed to get Mankichi to the hospital in time to save his life. And after a four-issue hiatus, Motomiya returned to Gaki Daisho with a brand new story arc. However, by the end of that same year, Motomiya truly felt he was done, and Jump allowed him to end the manga after 123 chapters. Only for Motomiya to have no choice but to return to it. You see, Motomiya's next series, 1972's Musashi, bombed hard and only lasted 25 chapters before getting cancelled. Left with no other option, Motomiya brought back Gakidaisho two issues after Musashi's cancellation. Though it's not like it ever truly left, as Three side story one shots were also serialized alongside Musashi. After less than a whole year, though, 
Monimia ended Gaki Daisho for a third time in early 1973 after 155 chapters in 20 volumes. And this time it stuck. A decade later, Monimia would make a two chapter story, but that was just to celebrate Jump's 15th anniversary. However, Motomiya was so utterly disappointed with everything he had done for Gaki Daisho after Chapter 88 that he prevented any and all releases of Volumes 12 to 20 of Gaki Daisho following their initial print runs, and he wouldn't allow them to ever see re-release until 2018, when Motomiya finally lifted the ban as part of Jump's 50th anniversary celebration. Since Gaki Daisho, Shonen Action manga would often wind up being some of the most popular series in various magazines, often running the longest and some can argue for too long in certain cases. And Motomiya's debut work is a perfect distillation of that, and how it often isn't necessarily the fault of the creator. Moving on, we finally reach the 70s with Babel II by Mitsutaro Yokoyama, aka the most important man in manga history you likely don't know about. Yokoyama effectively created the mecha genre with Tetsujin 28 during the 50s, and then later innovated the magical girl genre with Sai the Witch in the 60s, and with Babel II, he helped popularize giving humans literal superpowers. Running from 1971 to 1973, the story stars Koichi, whose last name differs in pretty much every single manga and anime version of the story. But in general, Koichi is a normal schoolboy who discovers that he's actually the descendant of Babel, an ESP-powered hero from the ancient past who protected the world. In fact, according to this series, the Tower of Babel itself was actually named after him. Koichi then has to fight off the attempts of the evil Yomi, another descendant of Babel who wishes to rule the world. And to assist him, Koichi has three allies he can call upon. There's Rotom, the shape-shifting panther, Ropros, the supersonic pterodactyl, and Poseidon, the giant robot. While not the first ESP-powered hero in an action manga, as Dororo's Hyakimaru predates him, Koichi is probably the first example of your standard, everyday person discovering powers beyond his belief and having to use them to save the day. Still, in the end, Koichi remains a schoolboy, so Yokoyama always has Koichi adorned in his standard Gyakadon while fighting evil, and no matter how damaged it gets, it'll always get fixed. Sounds kind of familiar if you're a fan of Fist of the North Star. This was likely done so as to maintain a feeling of familiarity with young readers, who also had to wear Gyakadon when they went to school. And it became so iconic that later manga creators would do the same thing with some of their characters, with probably the most well-known example being Jotaro Kujo in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Stardust Crusaders. In fact, Hirohiko Araki admitted that Jotaro's entire design was nothing more than him paying homage to Babel II. Hence why Jotaro wears probably the worst outfit you can think of when in the middle of the Egyptian desert. So, after all of this, we finally reach the point where the true blueprint for modern shonen action finally starts getting drafted directly. And I mean over-the-top elements, hot-blooded screaming, etc. And it's with a baseball manga that you did never believe was real. Running in Shonen Jump from 1972 to 1976, Team Astro by writer Shiro Tosaki and artist Norihiro Nakajima tells the story of the Astro Supermen, nine young men discovered by Jay Shiro, a Filipino man who once met Eiji Sawamura as a child during World War II. Sawamura is generally considered the Japanese equivalent to Cy Young, having legendarily struck out all of America's legends time during an exhibition match, and was even offered an MLB contract, and was actually stationed in the Philippines during the war. Where things get loopy is where Shiro states that Sawamura told of a premonition he had about nine men being born at 9.09.09 .09 on September 9, 1954, a.k.a. Showa 29, all of which bearing a baseball-shaped birthmark. When these nine men unite, they'll become the greatest baseball team ever, capable of not just beating the Yomiori Giants, but also the best America has to offer. When Shiro starts gathering these men together, Japanese baseball refuses to acknowledge their existence and tries taking them out early. Oh, and one of the Astro Superman actually wants to kill his spiritual brothers, creating a group of his own, Team Victory, and challenging our heroes to a literal baseball deathmatch. Yes, I did say kill. You know, this is your standard baseball manga of the time, one where a player will have to catch a ball speeding at them by tanking it with his chest. And training your body for a game requires having your fellow player repeatedly smash a giant tree trunk into your back. Also, 
players will swing a bat with such force that the only possible way to describe it is by naming it after something like the Andromeda Galaxy. And in order to keep your opposition from getting runs, you need to literally beat the ever-living hell out of them, even if it's your blood sibling that's in your way. Show no mercy. If it isn't obvious yet, Team Astro is, quite frankly, absolutely insane. And I hope you can start seeing how something that's ostensibly a baseball manga laid the general groundwork for Shonen action. It didn't erect anything, but it did pour the foundation. But we can't leave Team Astro without bringing up the peak of its insanity. There's a scene where main character Kyuichi Uno has to figure out how he can pitch a curveball unlike any other. One that no one in Team Victory will be able to hit once the deathmatch begins. Since a curveball is a type of spiral, Kiwichi starts eyeing a nearby rotary drill press. This is the 70s. You know what that means! Naturally, this works. Though it ran for 20 volumes, Team Astro only actually covers three games, with the Team Victory fight being the focus of the entire second half. Eventually, readers in Japan just tapped out to its insanity, resulting in its cancellation. In fact, while Tozaki continued to be credited as the writer, he actually wound up leaving the manga after a point, as even he tapped out to what Nakajima was making. So editor Hiroki Goto wound up becoming the new, uncredited writer, and the pair would rely on reader questionnaire responses to help guide the plot, which would become a popular way stories in jump manga would be directed in the future. If you're wondering if Nakajima or Goto knew anything about baseball, don't worry, because neither did star of the Giants Nobu Kawasaki, who Nakajima went to for advice. Speaking of Nakajima, he might just be the purest distillation of that hot-blooded style that shonen action would become so recognized for as working on Team Astro was immensely stressful and deadline-focused. Yet Nakajima would fight on no matter the trouble, whether it was vomiting, hair loss, hives, his hands swelling up, or even literally having to stop the presses because he had just barely missed a deadline. Understandably, he had to sign an affidavit promising to never do that last one again. In that regard, it is fitting that the final match ends with the antagonist crying literal tears of blood, because Nakajima would expect nothing less from his characters if he was going through his own battles telling their story. That, I feel, is the truest way to describe what Team Astro brought to the table for Shonen Action. Characters, and creators, that go beyond their limits, performing what should be impossible feats, pushing their bodies further than anyone can possibly imagine, just so they can achieve their goals. But, yes, Team Astro is absolutely, positively, madcap insane. Still, its influence is undeniable. Even legendary anime director Hideaki Anno is a giant fan of it. Next, we have two boxing manga that ran simultaneously, for the most part, in rival magazines, each one being inspired by some of the same works, but going in different directions. First is Gambari Genki by Yu Koyama, which ran from 1976 to 1981 in Shonen Sunday magazine, and tells the life story of Genki Horiguchi, the son of a talented boxer who returns to the ring only to eventually die during a fight. Genki, in turn, decides to become a boxer to honor his father, with the manga combining elements of Star of the Giants and Ashita no Jo, namely the rise of the main character from young boy to professional adult, and coming from a more downtrodden upbringing, especially after the loss of his father. Gambari Genki is really more important in the history of sports manga, as it was a direct influence on later works like Touch and Major, but its relevance in our context is in how it shows the difference in how Shonen Sunday was evolving compared to what Shonen Jump did with its own new boxing manga. And from here on out, we'll be focusing solely on Jump, as action is where it mainly innovated at, 
whereas a magazine like Sunday focused more on character drama, becoming the heart of shonen manga, if you will. Which brings us to Ringi Nikakero by Masami Kuramada. Running from 1977 to 1981, it tells the rise of Ryuji Takane, the son of a professional boxer who died before he could become world champion. Ryuji's big sister Kiku decides to start training Ryuji, who has no interest, but after their mother marries an abusive drunkard of a louse, Kiku decides to run off to Tokyo with Ryuji so as to train her brother into a pro who can give their mother a better life. Eventually, Ryuji becomes interested in boxing after meeting Jun Kenzaki, a young and cocky prodigy who becomes Ryuji's best friend slash rival. As the manga goes on, Ryuji, and later Kenzaki, meet and befriend three other junior boxers, forming the team Golden Japan Junior as they take on all challengers from around the world to prove their worth, before eventually ending with Ryuji and Kanzaki both going pro and having one last fight for the Bantamweight World Championship. As you can tell, there's a heavy influence from Star of the Giants, Gambari Genki, and especially Ashita no Jo, as it was created in direct homage to the last one. But Kermada was also heavily inspired by Team Astro. Though it first started as more of a character drama, a la Ashita no Jo, Kermada realized that he couldn't simply copy it, so he started taking influence from Team Astro's ability to attract the audience by way of its over-the-top and superhuman feats. Therefore, Kuramata introduced super blows, immensely powerful punches that pretty much broke physics with all sorts of thematic names that later include all manner of visual accentuation to help sell the feel and mood of each one. Readers in Japan eventually called this SF boxing, or sci-fi boxing, and from there it went on to be what Jonah considered Jump's first mega-hit. Ringi Kakero would help influence all manner of other creators as well. Takehiko Inoue, creator of later classics like Slam Dunk and Vagabond, once stated that an early scene showing a supporting character, before the series went full SF, would help inspire him to take up drawing, as he wanted to draw anatomy, shading, and drama like Kuramata did. Kazuhiko Shimamoto, hot-blooded creator of Blazing Transfer Student and Blue Blazes, became a hardcore Kuramata fan because of RNK, which in turn helped define his own wild and bombastic style. Yun Koga, creator of Loveless and Gestalt, is such a Kuramata fan, starting with Ring Kaketo, that the very pen name she uses is literally a reference to three of RNK's main characters. Also, if you're a fan of Mobile Fighter G Gundam, director Yasuhiro Imagawa directly took from RNK all throughout for that series, whether it was the usage of international stereotypes for Domon's world rivals, having all of them team up as a supergroup to take on a shared threat, referencing the World Junior Union, seen later on in RNK, or even the usage of faking out the audience by seemingly killing off the main cast in climactic battle, among other things. Meanwhile, you've likely seen all manner of references to Ring the Kaketo without even realizing it, such as in Gao Gaigar, The King of Fighters, Street Fighter, or even Super Robot Wars. In fact, Super Sentai series Kikai Sentai Zenkaiger would feature a Ring Nikaketo reference as late as 2021, a whole 40 years after the manga ended. In 2014, Shueisha gave RNK a digital release, advertising it as the hot-blooded fighting manga Bible. So let's go into why this manga is the Bible the all later shonen action series have followed. First, unlike Team Astro, while RNK did go for a highly over-the-top execution, it still adhered to the rules of boxing, as none of the super blows were anything more than actual punches. Even the aerial-based hurricane bolts became a real thing by way of MMA fighter Kazushi Sakuraba. It also introduced the idea of a team-based tournament to what's otherwise a solo sport, as while each fight Golden Japan Jr. fought was a one-on-one -on -one battle, the end goal was to defeat everyone on the opposing team. Today, almost any tournament arc in Shonen Action follows this format. Also of note is that RNK standardized the five-man band, which has since become the usual amount of lead characters a series will focus around at any given point. RNK even helped innovate the rescue arc, as there's a part where Kiku is kidnapped by a future enemy group, and Ryuji enters enemy territory to rescue her. Today, the rescue arc is a commonly used storyline in Shonen Action. Of course, there's also just a heavy use of previously established tropes and concepts here as well, all finally executed in a way that feels familiar to modern-day readers even after 43 years. Finally, RNK made history by becoming the first manga, in Jump at least, to have its final chapter be published in full color, as though it was an American comic. Since then, Jump has only given three other manga this kind of treatment, 
with Dragon Ball, Slam Dunk, and most recently, Naruto. So if someone ever asks you what manga is the origin of modern shonen action, you now know to answer with Ring Nikaketo. If Team Astro poured the foundation, then RNK set up the framework of the house called Shonen Action. Or hot-blooded fighting manga, according to Shueisha. Then there's Space Adventure Cobra by Buichi Tadasawa, which ran from 1978 to 1984. It follows the titular Cobra, a legendary space pirate who went into hiding one day as he became too wanted around the galaxy to do whatever the hell he wanted. He changed his face, blocked his memories, took on the identity of Johnson, and this sounds like the movie Total Recall, doesn't it? Well, Terasawa was obviously influenced by the same Philip K. Dick short story as that film, so it's not too long into the first chapter when Johnson suddenly remembers who he is, and Cobra returns to continue where he left off. In terms of relevance here, Cobra helped bring a pulp influence to Shonen Action, one where sexuality was a stronger element than before, as pretty much every woman is drawn to be beautiful, while the sci-fi aesthetic helped bring about the idea that Shonen Action didn't have to solely take place on Earth. Now, any world the manga creator could conceive of was free to use. Following that, we have Kinikuman, the iconic slapstick wrestler... Wait, that cover looks way too good to be from the 70s. There! Much better. Anyway, Kinikuman is the creation of writer Takashi Shimada and artist Yoshinori Nakai, who work together under the pen name Yude Tamago. Running from 1979 to 1987, the manga first started off as a gag manga parody of Ultraman, in which Kinikuman was the one hero no one wanted to save them, because he was so useless. After seeing the success their friend Masami Kuramada was getting with Ring Nikaketo, though, Yude Tamago decided to shift focus and make an action manga, utilizing the wrestling motif and references that they had already introduced, and turning the manga into an action series where good and evil Chojin, or Superman, fought each other in deadly wrestling bouts. Kinikamon himself, in turn, became the lazy, lackadaisical main character, who would only fight when given no other option, but tended to be the one with the most drive to save the day. While slapstick was still a common element to the manga throughout its run, it was also known for its ability to switch over to violent and bloody action once a fight started in the ring. Never be surprised to see someone literally be torn apart during a fight in Kinikamon. Being a popular wrestling manga, it's no surprise that Kinikamon not only utilized actual holds and moves during fights, but it also helped inspire actual moves that have been delivered in the ring itself. The most notable of these is the Muscle Buster, or in Japan, the Kiniku Buster, a move that professional wrestler Samoa Joe has helped make famous outside of Japan. And though he used it like a backdrop, so as to not actually kill his opponent, it still resulted in at least one injury so impactful that the wrestler who took it, Tyson Kidd, had to retire in 2015. However, probably the biggest impact Kinikamon left on Shonen Action was the idea that the hero who would constantly save the day would normally be one who doesn't really look to care much about being a hero, instead simply preferring to be lazy or do whatever pleased themselves. Oh, and is almost always hungry. Yes, before Goku or Luffy, there was Suguru Kiniku himself, the OG black hole of a stomach. Yude Tamago also helped introduce a new form of fan interaction, as they allowed readers to submit their own creations for Chojin, while Yude Tamago taking their favorites and implementing them in some fashion in the actual manga. While ending back in 1987, Yude Tamago did eventually return to this original series in 2010, and to this day the duo are still telling new stories with this original cast, almost doubling what the original length was. We now enter the 80s, the final decade of this panel, and we're going to start with Captain Tsubasa by Yoichi Takahashi, an iconic soccer manga that ran from 1981 to 1988. It details the life of Tsubasa Ozora, who has loved soccer ever since he was a baby, when a soccer ball literally saved him from being accidentally run over during a freak accident. So the manga itself tells the rise of Tsubasa as a soccer player, showing him play during elementary, middle, and high school, meeting new friends and rivals on the pitch all throughout. After ending the manga, Takahashi would try doing other series, but eventually returned to Captain Tsubasa in the 90s, and really hasn't looked back since. Showing Tsubasa's time as a professional soccer player who has played for real-life teams, and he's even attempted to get into the World Cup and Olympics. He even got married at some point, showing that he can love someone more than soccer. With soccer being known as the world's game, it's no surprise that it saw release all around the world, inspiring kids everywhere to take up soccer, and there are numerous FIFA players the world over who have admitted that Captain Tsubasa was what made them want to play soccer professionally. Except in north of Mexico, where soccer isn't all that popular. I mean, 
Did you even know that the most recent anime adaptation by David Production actually aired on TV in North America with an English dub over on Primo TV? What do you mean you don't roll what the hell Primo TV is? It's where Captain Tsubasa aired in English! Anyway, Yoichi Takahashi followed the lead of Ring Nikaketo and Kinikamon with Captain Tsubasa, delivering more of an over-the-top style of soccer, one with all sorts of named special move kicks and often making the pitch seem like it's miles long for dramatic effect. Takahashi even threw in a direct reference to both Team Astro and Ring Nikaketo with the move Skylab Hurricane. So, the next time someone tries to argue that a sports series that goes over the top is ridiculous and can't be taken seriously, just remind them that one of the most inspirational manga around the world of all time is also one of those series that apparently can't be taken seriously because it's over the top. Okay, we're nearing the home stretch, but first, we return to Masami Kuramata with Fumara Kojiro. Running throughout all of 1982 and 1983, Kuramata's follow-up to Ring the Kaketo shows the trials and tribulations of Kojiro, a young ninja of the Fuma clan, and the battles he and his brethren fight. What Fumara Kojiro brings to the table is that each of the three story arcs told in this series offers something notably different from each other. The first is a standard battle between the Fuma and their eternal rivals, the Yasha, while the last involves Kojiro having to deal with an attempted coup from within his own clan. Main attraction, though, is in the second arc, the Sacred Sword War, in which the manga essentially stops being a ninja manga completely, instead moving focus to a battle between the forces of Cosmo and Chaos, as preordained 4,000 years ago. Where all of the previous manga we covered dealt with rather general concepts like fighting against rivals, being the best, or simply saving the day, the Sacred Sword War deals with things like the concept of destiny itself, and if mere humans can fight against the literal wills of the gods themselves, introducing some heavy existential concepts to shown in action, something that would occasionally be used by other manga afterwards to help keep things fresh. Also, alongside the usual ninjutsu seen by the ninja in other arcs, the sacred swords themselves help introduce the idea of fantastical powers and abilities that aren't mere ESP, though there are characters who are also psychics, because why not, expanding the concept of supernatural powers to a whole new level for shonen action. While not a major part of this history, Fumura Kojiro does show an early sign and expanding the breadth of the genre beyond its usual standards. So it's about time we finally got to the obvious stuff, right? Well, up next is Fist of the North Star by writer Budonsen and artist Tetsuo Hada, which ran from 1983 to 1988. For those who have been hiding under a rock, the manga takes place in the post-apocalyptic year of 1990X and stars Kenshiro, the successor to the assassination art known as Hokuto Shinken, as he travels the land protecting the weak from those who take advantage of the power they have, before eventually getting involved in a power struggle revolving around his adopted Hokuto Shinken brothers and those who fight using the rival styles of Nanto Seiken. A mix of Mad Max and Bruce Lee movies, Fist became an instant hit and started what is now known as the Golden Age of Shonen Jump, which would last for the next 13 years. While not the first non-sports shonen action manga, Buransen and Hara very obviously took what manga like Ring Nikaketo, Kinikuman, and Captain Tsubasa were doing and transplanted them into its own thing, something definitively not sports related. And today it's generally attributed as the first definitive example of modern shonen action, which is honestly fair. While some tended to ride the series as being nothing more than muscle-headed action with no substance, Fist actually has a very sensitive and emotional core to it, and as the series goes on, that becomes more and more obvious. Specifically, it's truly telling that the ultimate technique in Fist of the North Star is Muso Tensei, a state of nothingness where nothing can affect you, effectively making you invincible. But it can only be achieved by someone who knows true sorrow, making it nigh impossible for anyone to actually use it. However, much like Otoko Ipiki Gaki Daisho, Fist of the North Star's massive success resulted in it going on for longer than Bronson or Hara really intended, so much so that even the eventual anime adaptation only covered up to the last real story arc of note, which itself was already beyond original intentions, leaving the last three volumes of content unadapted to this very day. Interestingly enough, Motomiya, Kuramada, and Hara would all go on to have roughly 18-year runs with Shonen Jump, and each of them would be immensely influential on in how shonen action would be defined for future generations to build off of. Funny how things work out, right? In the end, Fist of the North Star remains an epic-making series in the history of shonen action, with countless creators admitting to have been inspired by the tale of the Savior at the century's end. I mean, 
They even gave major antagonist Rao a real-life funeral in 2007, though in this case it was just for marketing purposes. Still, that's impressive. And, just to be pedantic, I should point out that Fist's iconic Hokuto 100 Crack Fist is not the first example of a special attack that sees someone executing multiple punches in rapid succession. In fact, Ring Kaketo did the super blow Ashura Mugensho first. And while that move is technically an illusion with only a single punch actually being thrown, the similarity in execution to Kenshiro's iconic attack is something to consider. And so, after covering 16 different manga series, we finally reach the real origin of everything shown in action. Akira Toriyama's follow-up to Dr. Slump! <laughs> Yeah, I really don't need to say anything about Dragon Ball, because everyone knows what this series is, even if you've never watched it or read it. Though there are some interesting things to talk about for a little bit. First and foremost, Toriyama is the pure definition of someone being forced into doing action manga, as he originally debuted it as more of a Jackie Chan-esque comedic series, but eventually had to focus more on serious action so as to keep the reader's interest. To be honest, if it was all up to Toriyama, he'd just continue making poop jokes with a Raleigh-chan. That being said, it's not as though Toriyama didn't enjoy more action-focused manga, because he certainly did, and it showed. In fact, Toriyama even sent a letter to Masami Kuramata around the time Ring Nikiketo ended, admitting how much he enjoyed Kuramata's series and how it inspired him to continue his dream of making manga. In fact, Raleigh's hat makes a cameo in RNK's final chapter, likely due to this letter. While still focused around making jokes and having a more loose and fun time early on, there's no doubt that Dragon Ball's early days still had a core attention to delivering well-done action. If Fist of the North Star took after the more dramatic and serious storytelling of titles like Ring Nika Kettle, Ashton no Joe, and the like, Dragon Ball's earlier portion definitely took after Kinikuman, mixing together hard-hitting fights with characters that are meant to make you smile and laugh all the while. For example, Kame Senin, Master Roshi, is no doubt Toriyama's equivalent to Danpei Tange, only with Danpei's penchant for liquor exchanged for an obsession with women's panties, and naturally that results in a change from character drama to one of perverse comedy. As for what else to consider, well, we need to move on to the penultimate manga for this panel first. Following the end of Fumino Kodro, which did come to an abrupt end because of his father's passing, Kuramata decided to then debut Otoko Zaka, an homage to Otoko Ipikigaki Daisho that Kuramata had planned to be his magnum opus. Unfortunately, this resulted in a manga that adhered to the previous era of shonen action, rather than continue the style that Kuramata himself helped innovate. Essentially, Kuramata outdated his magnum opus before it even debuted by following an oldest school ethos, so it was quickly cancelled. Don't worry though, he revived it a few years back and is still doing new chapters to this very day. So, after being told that he couldn't make the manga that he wanted to make, he decided to simply make the manga that he knew the mainstream would read, which became Saint Seiya. For those unfamiliar, the manga ran from 1986 to 1990 and focuses on the battles fought by the saints, the personal guardians of the Greek goddess Athena herself. Depending on where you live, Saint Seiya is arguably just as popular and influential as Dragon Ball. Except for North of Mexico once again, which didn't get the series until 2003, and by that point it was highly outdated. As mentioned, Seiya was conceived specifically to appeal to what readers enjoyed, which Kuramata definitely had good knowledge of by this point. That's why the manga starts with a tournament arc, as that's a popular storytelling concept, and why the series would eventually move on to a repeated use of the rescue arc, as Athena would often wind up being put in mortal danger. However, Kuramata did still have to adjust based on what the readers liked most, with a great example being how he initially introduced Unicorn Jabu as a rival character for Seiya himself, even basing Jabu's design off of RNK's Jun Kanzaki, only for Jabu to quickly become an ancillary character once Kuramata found out that readers preferred other characters more. Still, it was this adherence to appealing to what's popular, combined with an instantly toyetic concept, that resulted in Saint Seiya being adapted into an anime and toy line absurdly fast, with the first episode debuting the same year the manga started, just before it turned even a year old. The most interesting thing about Saint Seiya is that Kuramata essentially reintroduced his style to a new generation of readers, who likely only had heard of Ring Nikaketo, but never actually read it. Therefore, he was able to reuse concepts, names, terminology, 
character designs, and even plot styles in new ways, effectively taking Osama Tezuka's star system and applying it to more than just characters. This way, you can have something like Capricorn Shura, who wields the sacred sword Excalibur, which seems similar to Shura from Fumina Kojiro, who also wields a sacred sword, but otherwise is a completely different character. Meanwhile, Leo Iolia's iconic attack Lightning Plasma is completely different from Ring Nikaketo's Venus, who has a super blow named Lightning Plasma. Hell, Kuramata even reworked a Fumino Kojiro cover for a Saint Seiya cover. Finally, Seiya is known for being the shonen manga that truly found itself a notable female audience, with the yaoi fan scene becoming more notable than ever because of all the Seiya, and Captain Tsubasa, doujin that came about. In fact, Clamp got their start doing Seiya Yaoi Doujin. But, to quote ACDC, After all, Dragon Ball is most known for its Z portion, which moved the series into the energy blasting, fast punching, super saiyaning action that it's beloved for today. However, that part of the story didn't start until October 1988, with the debut of Raditz, which came after Saint Seiya's debut, by about a good two years. Likewise, Goku didn't turn Super Saiyan for the first time until March 1991, after Saint Seiya had ended. Could it be that Toriyama was encouraged by his editor to follow what Kuramata was doing with Saint Seiya? Look, all I'm really asking is, what came first? Super Saiyan, or the power of gold? Also, while I'm picking on Dragon Ball, Frieza's scouters are obviously just Toriyama making a reference to Blue Comet SPT Lasner, which debuted on Japanese television back in 1985. Finally, and I mean it this time, we end this history with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure by Hirohiko Araki, which debuted back in 1987, and technically is still running to this day, even though it was kind of ended back in 1999, only to then soft reboot back up in 2000, and then continue via alternate timeline stories after that, and why am I going cross-eyed? It's kind of difficult to easily explain JoJo's plot, because it's a multi-generational story about various members of the Joestar lineage over the courses of different periods of time, split up across multiple parts, of which there are currently eight. This allows Araki to make each part a completely different style of story, whether it's Victorian action horror, Indiana Jones style adventure, episodic road trip, semi-slice of life, mafia battles, etc. This way, it continually is able to welcome new readers with each new part, and once they get hooked, they'll want to go back and read what came before. It's all rather ingenious, honestly. As for action, Araki already had an advantage in that regard, and that was in his penchant for going wild and crazy. Before Jojo, Araki had made Bao the Visitor, which showcased all manner of wild violence and superpowers through its lead character, who could transform into a superhuman monster. Similarly, Araki gave the characters in Jojo a wide variety of abilities, starting with Hamon, which allowed users to control their breathing so as to produce an energy said to be the equivalent to that of the sun, which worked perfectly for the vampiric foes they fought. However, Jojo would find its greatest success with stands, semi-physical representations of each user's own spirit that stood alongside them in battle. Through stands, Araki could give anybody literally any superpower he could think of, whether it was control over fire, the ability to look into the future, entering pocket dimensions by way of all manner of options, the ability to control time itself, also in various ways, remote controlled bombs, the ability to heal any wound, or even stealing other people's stands and storing them as CDs. And these are probably the easiest ones to describe. Combined with Rocky naming stands after various musical acts, albums, or songs, after initially doing that for the characters themselves, stands would become just as iconic as the characters themselves in JoJo, and have since been very blatantly imitated with love towards what Araki did, with the two most well-known examples being the Spirits and Shaman King, and Persona's titular spiritual companions. So what have we learned after all of this? Namely, that shonen action has an extremely long history to it, and that it didn't simply come into being in the early to mid-80s. It naturally has elements that reach all the way back to Osama Tezuka, but the true origins of it really come from iconic sports manga. Which makes sense. 
like in any sport, there's a drive to come out on top and face off against insurmountable odds. And often that requires one to dig deep and find an inner strength they might not have known they had all along. While series like Dororo and Babel II showed early signs that stories could enter more supernatural territory if needed, it's truly manga like Star of the Giants and Ashita no Jo that showcase the early signs of what one can say defines shonen action manga, though they were definitely focused more on character drama brought about by the sports they featured, which Gambari Genki took to heart. Meanwhile, Team Astro and Ring Kero both move things over to a more fantastical direction, but it shows that Norihiro Nakajima and Masami Kuramada each look back to what Noboru Kawasaki and Tetsuya Chiba did, respectively, in order to figure out what to do next. Likewise, Kuramada looked at what Team Astro did, but toned the insanity down to a level in which the character drama could work in tandem with the spectacle, rather than feel like the drama was driven by it. Kinikaman and Captain Tsubasa followed Ring Nikaketo's lead and helped refine that style even more, while Kinikaman also brought in a strong level of comedy to help balance things out. Meanwhile, Cobra and Fuma no Kojiro simply dropped the sports pretense altogether, taking what had come before and implementing it with other influences, whether it was futuristic pulp novels for the former, or the tales of ninja from Sanpei Shirato, plus a whole lot of existentialism for the latter. Finally, Fist of the North Star, Dragon Ball, Saint Seiya, and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure would take everything that had been done up to that point and bring it to an even larger audience, both domestically and abroad, greatly expanding the reach and influence of shonen action in a way that almost none of the prior manga could have been capable of at the time. After this, you know the rest. To continue would be pointless, as it become the panel that never ends, as it will go on and on, my friends. There are merits for later series, like Yu Yu Hakusho reinforcing shonen action standards before challenging them to make you think, or Ushio and Tora simplifying things back to focusing on just a pair, or Grappler Baki pushing the boundaries of what one could get away with when it comes to visceral action, or Beat X essentially being Masami Kuramada deconstructing everything he had established in the 20 years since Ring Nikakero. Regardless, now you know the general truth behind where so much of what you love about shonen action manga actually came from. Now the next time someone tries to say that Dragon Ball established everything, you too can school them well. After all, the great conversation can only happen when people stand on the shoulders of the giants that came before them, before becoming giants themselves for the next group to stand on. <laughs>